What's up, everyone? Happy Friday. Welcome to Normalize It, the show where we speak about the business of disability inclusion and accessibility. My name is Cam Beaudoin, here for yet another week. Thanks, everyone, for joining today. It's uh, in Canada here. We have a holiday, and I appreciate anyone who's showing up on a holiday. If you don't have a holiday today, that's cool, too. Thanks for showing up. I really appreciate it. Today, I've got a really special guest from this really, you know, small company. Maybe you've heard of it. Microsoft. I don't know. Heard of it. Dave, you and I have connected a while back, and uh, I'm so glad finally we get to uh, to talk on the show today. Welcome. Finally. Thank you for having me. This is going to be a great conversation. Yeah, love it. A little bit about you. So Dave is a seasoned technology executive who is passionate about designing and developing hardware and software for users of all abilities. He has extensive experience in design thinking, product management, and agile delivery. Dave is a champion for accessibility and builds high-performing teams, fostering cognitive disability, uh, excuse me, cognitive diversity and inclusion. Dave, welcome to the show once again. And, and let's do some rapid fire questions because we want to learn more about you. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. All right let's, let's hit this off here. Okay. So first off, are you a coffee drinker or a tea drinker? Neither. I'm a water drinker. Water drinker. Okay. All right. I'll put you in that camp then. That's okay. Like audio books or podcasts? Audio books. And, and chocolate or vanilla ice cream? You're really kind of asking me to choose between mom and dad here. <laughs> I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to go vanilla ice cream with chocolate on it. Oh, there we that's go. a good one. Yeah. Yeah, love it. And are you an early bird or a night owl? Oh, I'm definitely an early bird. The earlier you get me, the smarter I get. Oh, By yeah. the end of the day, I'm just like a yes/no <laughs> kind of person. Are you like the five a.m. riser? Like, uh, like yes, and it annoys my wife i get up at 5 30 ready to work out ready to because what i love about the morning is it's got a world of opportunity right it's what are we going to do to make waking up worth it and it's always been my favorite time it's the, where i work out it's where i meditate it's where i grow myself and just kind of reflect back of am i doing what i wanted to do and stuff like that so Love the morning. Glad we're talking kind of early today instead of end of day, because then you get a much more vibrant Dave instead of a, yeah, what's up? <laughs> that, yeah, I'm in the same camp. I wake up and do things really early in the morning to, you know, because no one's around. Like, you know, I get the time. I get the time to do it. And you actually post a lot of videos and, and uh, pictures around your workout routine too. Probably won't get into that today, but uh, if anyone follows Dave, I'm sure you've seen those those pictures before. They're really cool. And Thank last you. one, I got, I got one more question before, uh, for you uh, as well. Are you a, a fiction or a nonfiction type of guy? I'm a nonfiction kind of guy, even though I love watching Marvel movies and but when it comes to where I'll read and spend most of my time, it's nonfiction because, you know, trying to navigate the world with a disability has its own fiction as well. And there's so much out there to still learn, right? I can I can already tell. Oh, that. for sure. Yeah, yeah. So, Dave, so today we're going to be talking about why assistive technology is like critical to, you know, things like program management, things like the organization as a whole. So first I want to talk to you about what's an incorrect assumption that most organizations or teams have around bringing in assistive technology or working with people who use assistive technology. Where, where do we even start there? So if I can understand your question a bit better, are you talking about using assistive technology like screen readers or, or voice to text, or are you talking about building accessible features into a product to make the product more accessible? I I'm just want to make sure. Yeah, most teams, I would say, you know, they struggle with that hands-on type of aspect around assistive tech. And it's really easy to say, let's just go download a screen reader to make it easy. But what else should we be considering? And what do you, what have you seen in your experience that most people get wrong? Well, I think what they get wrong is, and we're, we as vendors got to get better at it. They just don't know what kind of assistive technology is out there. Because there used to be a time where the only time we could get our assistive technology was going through an occupational therapist or some uh, speech pathologist or, or uh, 
vacation, vocational rehabilitation counselor. So that was the only one path to purchase. As we have more consumers with disabilities out there that might not follow the same model of going to the medical place, how do we move from treating them like a patient mm -hmm. to treating them like a customer and treating them like a user? I think even though we're getting better at designing and building for people with disabilities, we still have a huge gap of how do we market, how do we get that path to purchase to make it available? So we start with awareness. What can they do? What can they do to use it? And then not be settled on the first thing we find because not every assistive technology is equal and people with different disabilities or even different preferences may choose one over the other. Because I think sometimes assistive technology, we only get happy that it makes things possible. But if it doesn't also make things more usable and easy, mm -hmm. then we're just giving somebody another struggle to simply do what they couldn't do instead of doing it in a more equitable um, delightful, low-touch, very intuitive way. Yeah, I like that word that you said there, delightful, because that is so important, right? Like, how do we make just a great experience for users? I was speaking with someone recently who he he's a researcher, and he, he has done true research on how do people of all abilities interact with certain technology. And sometimes it's not adding stuff that's the best solution. Sometimes it's removing, making things simpler. It's not always just throwing another piece of tech in front of someone saying, uh, you know, like in an office scenario or something like that, fixing a chair is something sometimes as all you need to do instead of adding more devices to, to a workspace or something like that. And that's a great point, Kim. Even when uh, a couple of years ago at Microsoft, we released the Surface Adaptive Kit. Mm -hmm. And simply it's a box of stickers. Now you might go, what's a box of stickers gonna, how's it gonna help someone? But people need to be able, you gotta think about the path of a disabled user. Right. We don't just start doing, we have to get our device, open it up, set it up. And with the, with the Surface Adaptive Kit, it allows stickers with different key, um, different key touches where blind people could use it to be able to identify certain keys by touch. We could do port matching cables. Mm -hmm. And then for me that has a physical disability, what I liked about it was the lanyard we could put on to easily open our laptop. Because right. as you know, with some of the clamshell laptops, you got to basically peel it apart. And yes. not all of us have that strength. And before, I used to use a fork. And there's <laughs> nothing more embarrassing when you're at work with your peers one moment, just let me get a fork. I just got yeah, it. Right. It's not for lunch. It's for, it's to open up this darn laptop, right? And also what that Surface Adaptive Kit did, Cam, was it was actually elegant, beautiful stickers. It didn't make your device look like it was modified. Mm -hmm. It looked like it was productized. It was fashionable. Because I think assistive tech and aesthetics doesn't need to be mutually exclusive. Because as disabled people, we love beautiful products too. Right, right, right. And now I've been doing a lot more research recently or just learning about people who have things like nerve damage, right? Who, you know, when we think of things like uh, a button to open a door or continuing on this idea of, you know, opening up a laptop that's really difficult to use or just stickers, you know, some with ner nerve damage, we're not only speaking to people who are in wheelchairs or only speaking to people with cerebral palsy or things like that. We're just being about people with, you know, who have, uh, who don't have the strength, strength to open up uh, doors or, or devices or things like that. And I think that's, that's a really, like you said, elegant way to just make things more usable. And that's why designing assistive tech is so challenging, right? Because to a non-disabled user, if something is not usable, they learn to compensate because of their natural ability. They just might say, it's not as user-friendly as I would like or intuitive. But when you have a disability, that friction is the difference between can I use it or not. Right. And that's the beauty of studying disability like you're doing. We can see where that mismatch and challenges, and we can do a deeper study into it because 
It's not like they mask it and slowly just go, okay, I'm just going to modify the way I use it. We get to study what the real barrier is. And even then, when not disabled folk use it, mm -hmm. they realize they removed the friction that they just got unconsciously used to and didn't realize was there. Right. Exactly. Exactly. It's because we can observe something easily. Let's say someone who's not, not blind or doesn't have a vision impairment, we just get over it really quickly. And all of a sudden it's that unconscious stick, that unconscious block that we had is, is all of a sudden resolved. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And now what I like about your story also is that you didn't come from the world of accessibility before. No, you came from something totally, you know, not really. And then you later on became an advocate. So yeah, can, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So it was interesting in my career. I went to school for tech and business, and it's easy to think that someone in a wheelchair is going to work in accessibility, and I would purposely stay away from it early and midway on my career because I thought, how convenient is it to have the dude in the wheelchair preaching about accessibility? So I was an agile expert. I was a product expert, and I trained agile and product as my side gig because I love giving people a better way to work because yeah. everybody faces challenging and the quickest you can go from idea to user satisfaction, it makes everybody better. So I spent a long career there. And, you know, when the pandemic hit, I think a lot of us did a lot of soul searching, right? Mm -hmm. What is it I want to do? And so I turned 50 I broke the glass ceiling at a national bank and I was the vice president of Global Agile. But what I was noticing, Cam, was I was never seeing other people like me in the meetings I was at. I was really like, why am I the only one? Why isn't there? And I really wanted to make sure that with whatever years I have left in my borrowed time, how am I going to make sure that there's going to be others at the table? How right. am I going to ensure we enable other people with disabilities to be able to have careers, to have a life, to have colleagues that become friends, friends that become colleagues? And I chose to go to Microsoft to put my product delivery expertise and to learn about disability. The first thing I had to learn was there happens to be more disabilities than just cerebral palsy. So like you, just trying to do deep learning, understanding, and I am blessed to have Bryce Johnson as part of my team that really helped me understand disability and Solomon to understand advocacy and stuff. And then putting my product agile and leadership to really kind of um, supplement that Mm -hmm. We're able to really uh, do a lot of great things to really kind of learn from the community and advocate to be able to get products out there to be able to help them close the disability gap of trying to get more people with disabilities in school and yeah. trying to get them in the workplace, right? Yeah. Because that cognitive diversity is just so important, right? Like, if you and I thought exactly the same, we'd be redundant. Right. But the beauty is you and I have different strengths, weaknesses, experiences. When you build a team like that, we know how agile help cross-functional work. Add on top of that cross-cognitive diversity, then you, then you got a great multiplier because those that use our product should be reflective of those that build our product. And ensuring we build the product that represent all the users that we hope to use it really helps us to ensure where the gaps are so we can quickly align to try to solve them. Yeah, one thing that you touched on that I talk about a lot as well is that the best way that somebody can make effective change inside their organization, if you want to change your organization to be more accessible, more inclusive, things like that, Go get promoted. Go become a manager. Go learn some skills that are transferable and that can 
affect a broader range of people. And I think that's kind of tying into what you're talking about as well. If you're always at the, you know, if you're trying to affect like longer change and trying to bring on teams with different abilities and different ways of thinking, you know, becoming those leaders. And if you're already passionate about accessibility, already passionate about disability inclusion, then you're going to be able to make a bigger change inside an organization from an, from a, a higher level, an organizational change, a leadership kind of position. And if, if we're, if you just decide to stay in that one role where you're the doer, where you're always the one making that change, then of course you're going to feel frustrated. Like change doesn't happen fast enough. What do you think about that? I think you nailed, uh, you really nailed the point home. We got to be great change agents, right? And because when I applied for this job, I literally had no accessibility experience. Mm -hmm. But I'm so grateful, Chris Hunter, who hired me, she saw my um, years of experience leading organizations through change from waterfall to agile, from, from requirement building to design thinking to how do we look at a project and go to a product mentality. And she saw that, even though that wasn't on the job description, she knew that would be the exact thing the organization needed. Because when you're trying to influence for accessibility, as you know, Cam, it's about making it personal to people that might not have a disability. Right. Right. And I've been quoted, I love saying, we're all going to be disabled someday. Just some of us beat you to it. So when you design for someone like us today, we're actually designing for the future selves and where everyone else is going. Exactly. So why don't we get ahead and be there? Kind of like the old winged rescue thing of don't go where the puck is at, go where the puck is going. And everybody's losing their ability at some rate, sometime, either temporary or permanent. How do we get there to make sure we can meet them where they're at, to keep them creative, to keep them productive and just keep them engaged? And leading change means making it personable to everyone. Absolutely. See, I don't think you can be Canadian and not know that reference. But we're just going to take a quick break, everyone, and hear from our sponsors. I'm going to get back and talk more, more to Dave about uh, cross-functional teams. I think that's really, really great. Just everyone, hold on. We'll be right back. Where do you start when you're looking to innovate and create exceptional experiences for the greatest number of users? It starts by designing for people at the margins and including their feedback. That's why today I'm proud to say this show is brought to you by Fable. Fable offers digital accessibility testing and custom training powered by people with disabilities. With Fable Engage, Fable connects you with a network of skilled testers with disabilities all over North America who can provide valuable insights on how to make your digital products more usable by people of any ability. Fable works in every stage of the development lifecycle, accelerating your user research, design and development. And with Fable Upskill, you can get bespoke training on a variety of accessibility topics using your digital properties. This ensures that your team has the knowledge and skills to build products that work for everyone. And now remember, digital accessibility is not a checkbox exercise and needs to move beyond compliance. Create exceptional product experiences for everyone with Fable. Welcome back, everyone. Dave, I want to talk about something that we talked about just before the break uh, about cross ability teams and different thoughts and minds and stuff like that. Cause I think that is, we don't talk about that enough. In fact, I don't think that our industry really has enough data and that's a, that's a big fault of our industry. We don't do enough research into really how do we move. And there's a lot of research kind of on the very end user, you know, how does this work and how does that work? But kind of from an organizational point, we are, we are desperately in need of, of some real functional data on that. But Tell me from your experience, when you bring people of different abilities in, when you talk to people of different abilities, why is that beneficial and how do you start building that team? I think what's beneficial is disability can be so complex, right? So many, even if you take cerebral palsy, there's people that might have cerebral palsy that you would never know and very mm -hmm. profound cerebral palsy. And then when you add intersection of disability and intersection of you know, nationality, gender, the complexity is a multiplier. So I think when you're building great products, you're, it really starts with curiosity. What are you struggling with? And not just asking them questions, mm -hmm. just observe, watch, learn, really experiment and give them different options. Because I think sometimes we get excited. Of, we put a solution in front of someone and they're like, can they do it? Great, they can do it. We solved it instead of, did you watch how much they struggled using right. it? 
did you see some of the cognitive challenges of them really trying to, like if you've ever used voice to text, the way we write is different than the way we talk. Right. So when we dictate a message, it is in written form. So we have to go through and make it more concise. But think about when you're dictating something, you're trying to keep ahead. You're using so much cognitive energy and then you got to edit it through verbal commands. That cognitive load on somebody is putting such a tax on how to do it instead of what they want to achieve. Mm -hmm. By what, working with people with disabilities, you study, can they do it? Can they do it intuitively? Can they do it with the most minimal cognitive effort they need? And what are the different um, variations do they need? And that's the beauty for hardware. 3D printing has been that great kind of closure, right? Where, where the product leaves off and, and tailoring and customization needs to go further by the user. Now we can do 3D printing. Mm -hmm. In software and digital, we could always do it, right? We could customize it based on your login. We could tailor it to you. But hardware is something physical you got to touch. And I think now with 3D printing and the, the democracy of it getting mm -hmm. more and more affordable, people are going to be able to download schemas of all these special grips so we can make using their devices better. But we only learn that by working with them, understanding their struggles, designed for one extent to many, right? And, you know, as somebody with a disability, I've had people come to me, hey, Dave, we got this solution. We got this stuff. And I'm like, it might make you happy, but it's not yeah. really solving my problem. Like, if I had a dollar for every time someone showed me the Nike shoes, <laughs> now you can put, now you don't have to tie your shoes. I'm like, I can't even put my own shoes on. That's not the problem. Yeah, but maybe so, you get that sweet sponsorship deal that you've always wanted, right? There you go. Exactly. I can get some running shoes. But it's understanding where that mismatch is that you can only get from working with them and building it. And it's not like just bringing them in to get feedback. Why don't you hire people with disabilities? Because when you see them in their day to day, you get to understand. And that now reflecting back into my younger years of product making, I never had to struggle to explain to my teams why we had to do it. Because as we're building the product, as I was testing it, just doing basic QA of are we meeting the requirements? They got to see me struggle with it and mm -hmm. go, oh, why don't we build it like this? And that's simply, a, now that we have remote working and it's coming more proficient, hiring people with disabilities now has come a lot easier. Right. And I'm not, and you know, everybody is like, well, is it a token hire? I go, no, it's like in the old days, we used to go, um, we want these requirements, PMP preferred. Right. To me, I want those requirements and this diversity preferred. Where if I, you know, how do I get different abilities, invisible and visible? Right, right. Because what, I, what I'm afraid of, Kim, all the mistakes we made with visible disabilities in the 80s and 90s, I'm afraid we're at the, we're, we're almost going to do the same thing for invisible disabilities because we're not taking the time to be empathetic to it, to understand yes. it, to acknowledge it. We learn from visible disabilities. Why don't we quickly learn and, and fight those kind of um, just biases or misunderstandings of invisible disabilities? Yeah, that's huge. And these these biases and misunderstandings, uh, autism is hugely misunderstood. Kind of what I knew growing up or it was defined to me is so vastly different from the reality of what autism is. And there are some great people on all the social networks. Uh, I've We were talking before the show that I've just joined tw uh, TikTok in a meaningful way uh, to follow people with disabilities who are sharing their stories. And it's enlightened me to how people live with different types of invisible disabilities that I wasn't aware of before. I want to come back to just one thing that you said, though, about observing, because that is really, really big, because you're right. Someone may report using their words that they may struggle or not with something. And that is wholly based on their knowledge and, and acumen 
of the tool as well. Let me give you an example, right? Someone who knows a screen reader from birth or from that's the only way they've ever operated a computer is going to have a lot different experience from someone who just started using a screen reader last year. They're going to have a different level of ability, aptitude, and knowledge on the shortcuts even on, on, on the keyboard. So just to asking somebody, Hey, how did you like, how was that for you is not usually enough, but watching someone go through that, someone who has been using their screener for a long time. And I know people like that who just know the shortcuts so well, and they know how the web uh, operates that they're not going to complain. They're not going to say it's a bad experience. And that's the difference I think between the qualitative and quantitative research that needs to happen in our industry, just observing and watching people struggle through a piece of software. And they also may not even know they're struggling through it. And after observing, understand, right? Understand, exactly. Observe and understand. And even to take it one step further, Cam, it might be people that aren't used to technology, right? In Microsoft, right. we get that bias too, right? We think, oh, everybody uses technology. But let's be honest. If somebody acquires an injury or acquires a disability, they may not have even been exposed to technology at an early age. So it's not just learning the system tech, it's learning to how do I navigate an operating system? How do I how do I launch an application? So they could be learning at a very tech at a very computer one on one. And then we throw, and now you need to use assistive technology, which as we know, I think takes the assumption that somebody has a good technology background before using it. And I think that's a mistake we make as product makers is we can't assume people are technology native. Right. Now, as we move in the world, like you probably, you're a young chap, you probably always had the internet, right? Where there might've been like in my day, the internet wasn't around until I joined university. Mm -hmm. Hey, come on. I still remember dial up internet. Okay. Like, you gotta get yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember BBS, so even before <laughs> dial up internet, where like you dialed the specific number and it was a bulletin board system. Now that I've told everybody, everybody's gonna send me a senior discount everywhere. <laughs> so Zoomer magazine has already got you on the on on, on the roll. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Next time you see me, I'll have a cardigan sweater and I'll be yelling at people in my front yard. That's right. Yeah. But one thing that, you know, I keep seeing again and again, you, you know, we think that we've done something for the community. I see this very often in, in the deaf community, the, uh, the uh, sign language interpretation gloves that keep coming up again and again. And one yeah. thing I want to highlight, though, to everyone listening, right? 99% of the time, this comes from a good place. Right. 99% of the time, people come from a place of, I see, I think this is a problem. I want to help. And here I am trying to make uh, a tool, a technology. Uh, I want to do something. And yes, maybe the solution isn't great. But so, for example, the example, the problem with uh, sign language uh, gloves, you could say, is that whenever you see them, they're, they're only uh, one letter at a time, which is not how people who are deaf or hard of hearing or who know sign language communicate at all. Right. It has nothing to do with that. And so, when I think of the technology that's trying to solve a problem, going back to what we initially talked about of maybe reducing the complexity and just understanding the people from the other side, making things intuitive is probably the best, uh, the best route to go. And I like where you said people have good intent, right? I hear that all the time. Why did someone even try to design and build them? Like, isn't it the battle we've been facing the last seven years is to get people to even consider products like that either useful or not at least they had the right intent to do it and if we can spread the intent and then figure out now how do we take that intent and get them to think about it better and differently because you know a lot of times i think we can be overly critical even when you're designing products it's hard to design them equitable for every disability all the time Mm -hmm. So you really need to make sure you're balancing your roadmap and backlog on many different types of disabilities that where if you focus on one release for a certain type, make sure the next release you do something else, right? So it's kind of like any kind of product making. How do you keep 
the user is equally happy or equally frustrated because you're trying to balance out the curriculum. And, but it starts with good intent. And we got to start opening the window because there's certain camps like you know, Cam, that well, if it wasn't designed specifically for disab- disability, they can't count it as accessible. Right, right. And I'm like, and I'm like, why not? Like Windows Hello wasn't designed for accessibility. And Windows Hello is something you look at the camera and it automatically logs you in. Hmm. It wasn't made as a, an accessibility feature, but it sure makes my life easier when I don't have to keystroke a password right. every 10 minutes when my device rolls out. So let's extend it to, yeah, it was designed exclusively for disability, which is good. We still got to do that but kind of open up our appreciation for things that weren't actually built for disability, but helps people with disability and give it that kind of openness we do when it starts from disability first. I love it. I love it. Hey, Dave, we're just about at uh, a time here. And I want to ask you, you know, what's a, what's one big takeaway that you want people listening to, uh, to remember? Just don't design for the world you see, design Mm -hmm. for the world you can imagine. Because when I grew up in the 80s and 90s, I never pictured to be the career I had or do it. I had to keep one leg in the unknown of what could be possible while I had one leg in the knowing. So I challenge people when they're designing for today, also design for a world you don't see. Because the only way we're going to see that world is when we get bold enough to start designing for it. Yeah, I love it. And I was told recently by someone, that same researcher that I was talking about earlier in the show, uh, he said something really interesting, which is intuition only works for someone exactly like you. So if we're always based off our intuition and we're not opening up and asking those questions, then it's not going to get very far. Dave, what's the best place to find you? Where do people follow you? Where do you post those great pictures of you doing your exercise routine? Well, I... Luckily, I post more than just pictures of me because I'm not much to look at, but I they can find me on LinkedIn on David Dame. I use my full name. I only use my full name for LinkedIn, and when my wife is mad at me, she uses the full name. Mm. I'm on Twitter at DDame, where you can follow me around. You can email me privately at dave at davedame.com. I love speaking to organizations. I love you know, I'm still deep in the agile and design UX training. Feel free to reach out, um, you know, research and find other people you want to follow. And the more we can learn from each other, the better we co- become. Absolutely. Dave, thanks so much for coming on the show. Your insights are so good. And I love the angle that you come at with your story because it's it's not from a from an accessibility background. I mean that in the best of ways. It's from lived experience and experience in doing other things than just working on alt text and labels all the time. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. Yeah. Hopefully everybody else enjoyed it. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully. Uh, And I get asked quite often if ever you'd like to support the show, you can take a quick scan of the Patreon uh, barcode up on screen right now, or go to www.camb.pw slash Patreon and support the show there. Or you can buy some swag at a11y threads. Dot com. We've got mugs, we've got laptop bags and t-shirts and stuff like that, even the snazzy hat, but not in black because this is now my logo or something like that. So everyone, thanks so much for attending. Dave, thanks for coming on the show and we will see you next week.